So um, Marianne Moore's poem, Poetry, which Wendy just mentioned, goes like this. I, too, dislike it. Reading it, however, with a perfect contempt for it, one discovers in it, after all, a place for the genuine. My poem is Women's Poetry. Women's Poetry. I, too, dislike it. However, I was trying not to think when out of the gaping wound of the car detailing garage smells like metallic sex came a Nissan GTR fitted with an oversized spoiler. Backing out sounded like clearing the throat of God. A gold snake zizzed around the license plate. Sunburst hubcaps, fancy undercarriage installation, casting a pool of violet light on the pocked pavement of gum blots. Was it this that filled me with desire? So um, you may not realize it, but there are basically three rules of poetry. One is don't write about babies. One is don't write about cats. And the third is don't write about getting drunk. This is called midnight feeding. The open shed on the lawn's far side stinks of gas from the hateful mower that pulls me where it wants when I mow, which is seldom. I rip up grass. Humid nights, moons, nothing halo. The lawn pretends to candy floss. Black-white dud roses, dead since June. Alive enough to scratch my bare legs. I'm wearing nothing but underpants, flip-flops. Arms full, I stumble out, flashlight in my mouth, turn my head to choose what's lit. Inside the dirt floor shed, I fill bowls, dry bits, tuna slop. The flashlight hurts my mouth till I drop it, dwindles into its cone where it falls to blight a denticular leaf. Raphael, Gabriel, Lucifer, feral kittens come running, vicious, filthy, hum of the road, Uriel shines his reflector eyes from among mower parts in the shed's darkest corner. Disgust shakes his paw. He won't get close since wild La Mama ran off weeks ago. My three-month daughter cries on the baby monitor I wear like a Miss America sash. She'll wait. Uriel must eat. Can't leave them. Coons or coyotes would get the food and kittens, too. My fur rises on my arms. What a bad mom. Also, I refuse to look at the stars. There are too many stars in poems you have to get drunk to write. So I really did see Henry Kissinger outside the Louvre in Paris. Um, this was in 2008, and... I think Obama was soon to be elected president and we were feeling optimistic. And I thought this was kind of an optimistic poem that sort of responded to that uh, climate, but um, some people say it's a very sad poem, so I don't know. You can let me know what you think. It's called um, Kissinger at the Louvre, Three Drafts. One, Kissinger in black tie shuffles to the town car, idling at the museum complex edge, between where the glum pay pyramid rises and the gardens begin. Is that, I say, and yes, says Jim, baby in his arms, me shoving the empty stroller to get home by nap time. Nobody notices, clicking at each other through camera phones, Kissinger looking matchlessly neat, clean, ugly, and dressed by servants. His driver's at the door, arms stretched wide as in a fish this big tall tale in welcome. 
The ear-wired bodyguard, hand on Kissinger's gray fur head so it won't scrape the door frame, bends him into the car. If I were a different kind of poet, I'd put Kissinger in front of the raft of the Medusa, blinking at the father weeping for his son, lying dead over his lap as the sails of the ship that will rescue them are sighted on the horizon, and the top man in the spout of survivors waves his ragged undershirt. Or I'd put him gazing reflectively at the death of Sardanapalus, a potentate presiding amid an exorbitance of fabrics over his imminent suicide by fire, slaves bringing in, in order of importance, horses, gems, plate, and favored concubines for slaughter. I'm not that kind of poet. Two, Kissinger totters befuddled by culpability, luncheon champagne, and dotage. The car eats him. I won't pretend the bodyguards Vietnamese or Cambodian, though that's the obvious truth in lies move. He's French, that rat-faced, handsome, smoked out look, and doesn't care merit for history. He makes the old man bow, same move with which the beat cop, our public servant, submits the petty criminal to the cop, put to the patrol car. Same move the anguished teenager got, half protective, half corrective, or coercive, half kind, after the arraignment for leaving her newborn to die in a rest stop dumpster. Anybody can understand the girl, and even the purse snatcher. Bodyguard bends Kissinger gently in, portly little Kissinger, gloves his head. Anything hurt will be the hand of the servant. Ecru upholstery with oxblood accents, minibar something like a safe, CNN muted to news crawl, and the anchor's frozen flesh face. The latest assistant, gender irrelevant, busy with a blackberry across from him, root beer colored eyes and preternaturally neat hair of La Belle Ferronniere, keeps the lap desk, emergency magic wand stain remover stick, eyebrow brush and dossier of opinions in what looks like the football, the nuclear war plan suitcase presidential aides carry at all times, but isn't. Three. The one camera flash as he got in gave Kissinger a headache. As they start for his Avenue de President Wilson Hotel, the Rue de Rivoli sliding by in a haze, he falls uncomfortably asleep to the anodyne glow and murmur tourné à gauche to, of the driver's GPS device. The relieved assistant opens an imagist anthology. In Osaka, Oslo, or Wasila, Alaska, some weeks later, a woman at her kitchen table uploads Paris vacation photos to her laptop. Who's that behind me? A dark figure. He looks familiar. How should I know, says her husband. I'm trying to get baby to eat more potato. Oh well, I look fat in it, she says, and deletes. Next poem um, takes place in a tawdry Jersey Shore motel. It goes back and forth between um, the scene in the motel room and the movie on the TV in the motel room. It's called Economos, uh, <coughs> Econo Motel, Ocean City. Korean monster movie on the sci-fi channel. Lurid Dora the Explorer blanket draped tent-like over baby's porta crib to shield us from unearned innocence. The monster slings its carapace in reverse swan dive up the embankment, triple jointed bug legs clattering, bathroom door ajar, exhaust roaring, both of us naked. Monster chomps fast food stands, all that quilted aluminum, each through streams of running people, the promiscuously cheerful, guilty American scientist dies horribly. Grease-dusted ceiling fan paddles erratically, two spars missing. 
Sheets whirled to the polluted rug. I reach under the bed, fish out somebody else's crunched beer can. My forearm comes out dirty. Monster brachiates from bridge girders like a gibbon, looping round and around uneven bars. Those are your fingers in my tangles, or my fingers. My head hangs half off the king size. Monster takes tiny child actor to its bone stash. Pillows wet. The warped ceiling mirror makes us look like fat porno dwarfs in centripetal silver nitrate ripples. My glasses on the side table tipped onto scratch-proof lenses, earpieces sticking up like arms out of disaster rubble. Your feet hooked over my feet. What miasma lays gold dander down on forms of temporary survivors wandering the promenade? You pull Dora back over us. Baby's dead to the world. Intrude your propagandistic intimacy jokes, unforgiving. What, in a motel room, I say? Purple clouds roll back to reveal Armageddon, a dream in bad digital unreality. Explosions repeat patterns like fake flames dance on fake fireplace logs. Sad Armageddon of marriage. How pretty much nice we meant to be and couldn't make a difference. So um, in the uh, 18th century, Christopher Smart was a poet who um, used to um, fall down in the middle of the street and pray and do things like that and was institutionalized as a result. Um, and his, um, uh, in prison he wrote poetry and um, his most famous poem is probably Jubilati Agno, which means Rejoice in the Lamb. Um, and the most famous part of that poem is known as the Cat Jeffrey poem. Um, and um, in it, he, he writes about his cat, Jeffrey, as a kind of way of praising God. And um, I'm going to read you, I've written a kind of... Uh, version of, of uh, Jubilati Agno, but I'm going to read you uh, a few lines from the original so you'll get your, the sense of it and a sense of the language. Um, each line, you'll notice, starts with the word for. So, uh, for he, this is Christopher Smart. For I will consider my cat Jeffrey, for he is the servant of the living God, duly and daily serving him. For at the first glance of the glory of God in the East, he worships in his way. For is this done by wreathing his body seven times round with elegant quickness? For then he leaps up to catch the musk, which is the blessing of God upon his prayer. For he rolls upon prank to work it in. And it goes on and on for a long time. Um, but so I've written a poem called um, Jubilate South Philly, City 14. I live in Philadelphia. Um, and I've taken a cue from Christopher Smart in the way I've set it up, and I've also just um, stolen a bunch of language from him. Um, so any language that sounds odd is probably not my fault. Jubilate South Philly, City 14. For I will consider how to be 14. For will you please not act like you know me? For quit talking to me like I'm a kid. For when I walk, I keep my shoulders crooked back. For I walk in threes, looking bright into the distance, as if I'm more concerned with something else. For if I am one, I am not the prettiest, just the one who holds my shoulders farthest back, hems my uniform skirt the highest, so the space between my knee socks and skirt is exceeding pure, is good to think on, if a boy would express himself neatly. For I know just how to sneer to get a boy to like me. For if I am too, my fat, which is beautiful, pushes out in the gap between my shirt and low-rise jeans. I snap my gum, blow bubbles the size of spalding balls, wear dark eyeliner, line my lips outer edges with a different dark than my lipstick's pink. For the tattoo I want at the base of my back that my mother won't let me get is a rising sun the flames of it just licking up out of my jeans. 
For if I am three, I am sort of shy and pretty. I sort of go along and wish my parents would let me stay out later, and no one notices me, and my friends are so funny, the funniest, the coolest. I wish I could be so funny and cool. For at the first glance of the glory of Frankie on 7th Street, who has his learner's permit, I worship in my way. For I wreathe my body seven times round with elegant quickness. For I leap up to catch the musk of his aftershave, though he doesn't really need to shave, which is the blessing of Frankie upon my prayer. For I roll upon prank to work it in, i.e. sometimes he touches my elbow and I think I'll never wash again. For last year, everyone had henna tattoos and little stretchy chain chokers. And this year, without saying anything, no one's wearing them anymore. Why didn't I notice? For I look up at my friends for instructions. For we go in quest for food, jalapeno poppers, diet cokes, cheesesteak with. For I can tread to all the measures upon the music, Shakira, Eve, Christina Aguilera. For I have this certain gesture, I bend my arm up, crook my hand, fingers somewhere between loose and tense, palm down. For accompanying the gesture, I let loose a little sharp breath. <laughs> For I go, <laughs> For I've had it, I'm up to here. For okay, it's over dramatic, it's too much, but like what am I supposed to do, spraggle upon waggle at the word of command? For I should yell at my sister. For I am tenacious of my point. For, oh my God, Rini just went and got her belly button pierced and her mother's going to kill her. No, she ain't, says Rini, and everybody giggles so hard they're leaning sideways. For they are falling down almost. For at 14, I am not too young to be sexy and not too old to fight with the nine-year-olds on the block. For, no, I say, and fuck you, I cry. For the doubling of diphthongs is the improvement of the arguer's talent. For we stand in the light on the corner again tonight, the boys come around like most times, and this old man, like 35 at least, says, you girls get home, what are you doing out so late? And Rini really sasses him and he walks away and oh my god, it's so funny. For shall I not be good and sweet? For shall I not be important? for I am mean to the dog, for I swear at it. Then I'm nice to the dog, see how nice, see how animal loving. I hug this furry thing and bury my face, my only friend. Ew, you smell, get away from me. For I brush my hair hard, it snaps and floats heavenward. For in brushing of it, I perceive light about it, both wax and fire. For then I apply frizzies, and bless the name of John Frieda that my hair is all better. For shall I buy green or orange sneakers? For maybe if I am 14, I'm six months pregnant, and everybody looks sad when they see me, and I don't know which is the father, don't care, and none of them hang with me anymore anyway. For I don't care, because they always stole all my cigarettes anyway. For I'm quitting, I really am. For I hope it was Frank, for he called me once since. For my face is so puffy, but I don't even care, for I don't even know why. For nothing's on TV, and Ma won't pay for DSL. For I would never get an abortion. Ma won't let me. For Ma will take care of it, and it will be fun to dress up. For on the Broad Street line the other day, I heard what they were saying. For anyway, Shell rode me on the back of her bike and we screamed because my belly was pushing into Shelly's back and we were laughing so hard it was so funny. For dumb old Shelly said, I told you you better stop riding with those bo boys. It won't lead nowhere but the bedroom. Now see? At least I had fun while she stayed home. For I always put dried roses in my bedroom. For I tell everyone I always put dried roses in my bedroom. For the goddamn air conditioner is broken. For even so, I can swim for life, for I can creep. For it is hot out, and where do I go, pregnant, on a summer day?
So the next poem um, I find hard to read, but I kind of like it, so I keep trying to read it. The reason it's hard to read is because um, uh, I have to do voices of other characters, like I have to do the voice of a, a professor, and I have to, this is an elegy, and in the, the man it's an elegy for, I, I do his voice in the poem, and the problem is that he, he in the poem does voices of other people. So, um, like he does, um, he quotes lines from T.S. Eliot's Wasteland, and, um, but he does it in like the voices of an Aussie bartender or stuff like that. So, um, and, and later I, 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 I'm used to doing his voice, doing his mom. And so I'm not an actor, so you can see the problem. But um, I'm gonna try it anyway. A um, Couple references, Duccio and Giotto are um, early Renaissance artists. Uh, Donatello is also a fairly early Renaissance artist. And the Scriveni Chapel is in Padua, Italy, where, um, and it's where Giotto did his uh, cycle of the, of the lives of Mary and Jesus. Um, so, we'll see how this goes. This is Elegy in Memory, DK, Scriveni Chapel, Padua. Even Duccio can't manage Giotto's stage. Ma Sorry, let's start over. Even Duccio can't match Giotto's stage management of great tragedy. Transgendered Professor Y in leather miniskirt paces before the screen, wood pointer scraping saint faces, slapping the hunched women of the lamentation. Blue gold tumult of the chapel walls after lunch lecture hall heat. You're in that class with me. We go on from there, not long. You do the wasteland in different voices. Come in under the shadow of that red rock, Strom Thurmond, Aussie bartender, Cantonese. Hurry up, please, it's time. 20 years later, I get your news by Facebook update, 300 characters or less, waiting for the Scriveni to open in the windy square across from Donatello's horse and rider. Dust flecks foaming past fetlocks and stirrups. You're someone I slept with long ago, stopped, pitied, forgot. Some remember the Berlin Wall, some remember Vietnam, or the first Gulf War. I don't remember you, except standing by my chair in the smelly bedroom, blue sheets undone. You scrub at your head wet from the shower, drop the towel on the floor. You ice my earlobe, light a match to sterilize the needle. You say, give me a small red new potato. You say, Kev pierced my ear with a needle and potato. We were drunk, maybe tripping. Mom was waiting when I came in, 3 a.m., and saw the blood. You jab. No pain. A tearing through resistance. Tissues numbly separating. You do your mom. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, she screamed. Have mercy. So um, I write a lot of narrative poems, as you may have noticed. Um, this this narrative, this poem, um, kind of has a wanders around a lot and has a lot of people talking in it. So I'm just going to give you the people in it, sort of the dramatis personae. Um, this this so in this poem, um, Princeton College, Princeton University seniors are coming back from Wall Street interviews on a commuter train, um, and the main characters are um, Justin and Brianna, who are Princeton seniors. Um, the speaker is a pregnant adjunct creative writing teacher. I wouldn't know anything about that. Um, uh, she's also coming from an interview. Um, there's a, uh, a character um, named Soon Ji, who's very important, who is um, off stage. He's never sort of in the poem, but they talk about him a lot. There's um, 
a midwife and a yoga teacher. Um, Paul Krugman, the New York Times economics columnist, makes an appearance. Um, and Justin and Brianna are in the speaker's creative writing class. Um, and um, Justin and Brianna are going to get these really fancy jobs on Wall Street, they think. But you know, in their senior year, they take the class that they sort of didn't want to miss taking, the creative writing class. And then they're going to go on and beat the world. So um, this is sort of like creative writing is their final fling, you know. Um, and um, Justin has written a poem called Torment, and it's seven pages long. And um, my poem is also called Torment, and it is also seven pages long. So um, I just looked up at the clock to make sure I had time. Um, torment. I fucked up bad. Justin cracks, cracks his neck, talking to nobody. Fifteen responsible children, final semester college seniors, bloodshot, collars undone, gorgeously exhausted, return from Wall Street interviews in attitudes of surrender on the dinky, the one-car commuter train connecting Princeton to the New York line. Panic sweat sheens their faces. Justin hasn't seen me yet. Something's fucked with my tie, he says. He's right. I see his future, the weight he'll gain, first in his face, then gut and ass, the look of bad luck he'll haunt his bad jobs with. He tears off the tie, elephants on it. Fatigue, swollen ankles, the midwife said. The worst discomforts of pregnancy. I wrote those down, but she's wrong. Self-pity. Strange dreams, she said. No dreams. Discarded newspapers, business section, money, real estate, auto, sift apart to quartos and folios underfoot. Shut up, Justin, says the girl across from him. I hardly recognize Brianna in her interview hair. She scratches her face, fingers trembling from the day's aftershocks. I wanted, she counts on her fingers, performing the sitcom of her tragedy. Tribeca loft, expense account, designer clothes so hot they don't look it. My very own Tesla, summered home in the Hamptons I'm too busy to use. You wanted money, says Justin. Brianna says, it went down with the towers. I spent my lopsided day lifting my belly back towards center, interviewing for adjunct jobs. There's a half moon in half clouds up over the tracks. Justin spreads over three seats, texts with his thumbs, talks. The Lehman Brothers guy asks me, did you ever sell anything? Sell me a bottle of water. I'm like, fuck. To say something, I say, why do you like water? He says, Justin fixes a diamond stud back in his ear. He says they'll let me know. Fifteen responsible children sigh in disappointed relief. Somebody they know didn't get the job they didn't get. I sleep, wake. Beautiful clothes spread bodiless before me. Tailored black suits and skirts, silk ties, ephemera of sheer and filmy stockings deflated over seat backs. Brianna looks around, no conductor coming, squats to peel off in one motion, skirt, hose, underpants, step butt naked into soft chino shorts I'll never be able to afford. Nervous crotch sweat, she says. I keep trying to look not quite 40 in a different way that I'm not quite 40. The woman interviewer looked at my belly. She said, as a new mother, would you have time to be literary mama to your students? So I could sue when they don't hire me for the job I don't want. Justin looks up from his iPhone. Soon G got three offers, fuck. He flips the curl, his mother's fingers crimped, first day of pre-K into his four-year-old forelock. He's guessing he'll go with Goldman Sachs. Brianna grabs her neck in living garrote. 
She high fives anybody she can reach in gloomy delight. She gobbles snack pack popcorn, licks her fingers, bits drop yellow from her lips. My mom will go crazy, Deutsche Bank didn't offer. She sees me. I didn't realize that was you with your hair up. Look, Justin. She high fives me. It's Professor. Is Brianna crying? Don't call me Professor, I say, dozens of times a semester. I'm a writer, not a teacher. Justin grabs a Norton anthology out of his $500 briefcase. Fuck, what are we supposed to read for tomorrow? Proofrock, dummy, Brianna says. You're a good professor. She condescends through tears. Poor baby, mocks Justin, slumping so low in the seat I only see his shoe soles on the armrest. The train swooshes through suburban tracts. The moon gets smaller. Brianna arrives mornings to workshop in a fake hurry and the sweats she slept in. Probably rolls back in bed after. She hands out slight, surprising poems, apologizes, sips cardboard container coffee in a recyclable sleeve, turns her blackberry to vibrate. It moans like indigestion through class. I hand her one of my self-pity tissues. My ankles are slim. Brianna hates her name. So tacky, I'd be a Kelly if I were 20 years older. I'd like to be able to hate her. I'm turning into my favorite teachers, so kind, so industrious, so interested and interesting. Sorry I'm late with my portfolio, she says through sniffles. She dabs her lip. I had to prepare for a breath. Interviews. A few times a semester I say, it's only poetry. Gum bleeds, nose bleeds, the midwife predicted. And it's true, my Kleenexes are measled with blood. Weird hairs, stretch marks, frequent cat naps, hip joints so loose you must take care walking. The fetus dabs its fingers into the sp in the sponge of me, flails. At the second class, Brianna said, my mom would go crazy. I can't read all these sex poems. We're Christian. I said, poems should be about life. Part of life is sex. Two kids wrote that down in notebooks. <laughs> One was Justin. But skip any reading that makes you uncomfortable. Next week, Brianna wrote about hanging onto stall walls in her residence hall bathroom, fucking Princeton boys one by one. Justin's poem was Torment, seven pages long. Favorite teachers write poems about students. Reading them is like listening to horrors talk about clients. However contemptuous they sound, everybody knows who's selling, who's buying. I'd like to be able to like them. I sleep, wake. Justin's your boyfriend, I whisper to Brianna. My cell phone rings, screen says it's my husband. If I answer, I'll cry. Voicemail takes it. God knows, says Brianna. We hate each other, right, Justin? Never date the competition. You destroy your luck. Besides, she starts morosely high-fiving again. I'm a virgin. Justin laughs. She wraps her hair around her face to smell it. She says, I pay attention in class. Professor Krugman, he's a real professor. She points at a headline I just kicked, housing upturn predicted. He says, housing increases don't matter in the long run. It's a blip if it's even a blip. If I don't get a job, it's Wharton MBA or teach English in Japan. But this girl on my floor told me Asian girls depilate their whole bodies, even their arms. I can't be the hairiest person in my life. What will I do next year without the job I don't want? I sleep. Hey, says Brianna, I could go back to Spain, smoke Ducatos and Occupa cafes, be a poet. Sorry, laughs herself out of last tears at the idea. I don't mean to get all Sylvia Plathy on you. Anyway, my trust fund is safe, not plastic. She reaches up to wrap the tie Justin hung over the seat. I say, in Madrid, workers smoke Ducatos. Reds are for anarchista Euro trash wannabes. Brianna lips the cigarette she'll light on the platform. I'll have my portfolio next week, I promise. 
All semester, she's revised following precisely, appallingly, my suggestions. She says, think of me as raw talent wasted. I'm pissed I think of her at all. Justin again, talking at no one. Merrill Lynch says, what interests you in our company? I'm amped, I'm whipped, I'm like, um, I heard you were hiring. No, I'm giving him eight good reasons. He cuts me off. The train slows, surceases with a hiss. Fifteen responsible children stand in the aisle. Jizz, Jess, fuck, markered on seats by younger, irresponsible children. Off the train, Justin jumps into a low Mazda coupe, yellow as Dick Tracy's hat, parked unticketed at an expired meter, open to the rain. I auto-dial. I'm at the station. Don't come. I need the walk. Brianna says, where's Soonji anyway? Flying his plane back? God, what'll we do if nobody wants us? Justin says, Soonji will fucking keep us, I guess. All we have is dad's money. Brianna says, mine's mom's. Half of it gone in the crash. But soon G is great-grandfathered in. He'll be richer than we'll ever be if he never gets a job at all. Justin says, Professor, you hand back comments tomorrow, right? They're important to me. Fuck you, suck up, Brianna says. Sometimes I forget I'm pregnant till I walk. Brianna vaults into the car, leans out. Want a ride, Professor? Cigarette? She puts one in my mouth, lights it with a naked boy lighter that squirts fire out his tiny penis. Beer? Tears a can off his six-pack choke ring, sticks it in a baggie she pulls from Justin's glove compartment, pops the top, shoves it in my hand. Now you can't walk home. S pregnant, smoking, carrying a beer? You'd be arrested. Anyway, Sunji is having a party. Cristal, rappers. He produces them and brings his stable down from Queens. You have to come. He was going to take your workshop. He admires you, but he took playwriting instead. For final relaxation in prenatal yoga, we do our Kegels squatting in a circle, shut-eyed, for perineal strengthening, the teacher said. Then we lie on our sides, breathe in, breathe out, bellies like dropped anchors on the floor. Our muscles tick, smoothing, loosening. The teacher reads an affirming poem. I tense up. Brianna says, we always say Krugman's one of the few professors we'd friend on Facebook, but Daisy, we'd friend you too. Memory, favorite teachers at our college house parties, slow dancing with us, doing lines in our bathrooms. When are they gonna grow up, we said. I wave, walk, drop the cigarette and the beer, the can in the, tr in the trash can, relieved to be embarrassed triumphant, sorry. Justin drives along beside me. Brianna rides shotgun, standing like a surfer on a breaking wave. Justin, fuck, floors it, roars past me, away, away. I don't know how to end this poem. On Torment, I wrote, you may want to find a way to suggest ironic distance between the poet and speaker. I couldn't figure out what else to responsible children there was to say. So um, my book is, my new book is called Women's Poetry, Poems and Advice. And so this is the advice part of the evening, of the afternoon. Um, and in a moment, Wendy's gonna help me come, is gonna help me by coming up. And uh, I'll just t tell you a little bit about um, so the poetess is an, is an advice columnist, and she's a, people write to her for advice about poetry and life, and um, she's kind of a narcissist with a heart of gold, and um, any resemblance to real persons living or dead is entirely coincidental. Um, so um, what should I tell you about her? Um, she sometimes takes a tip from her colleague in uh, advice, uh, Dan Savage, the sex columnist, um, if you've ever seen his letters, um, uh, when people write to him, they sort of sign off with clever names, and he will sort of change them by ac like a by shortening them or do a clever acronym. So, for example, if um, if someone writes to the poetess and signs off as poet mom to be, she might um, 
she might uh, write back to them as Pomo. And um, mother addicted relentlessly to young ras rascals gets addressed by the poetess as martyr. And uh, nulipara, which is a word for someone who's never been pregnant, a woman who's never been pregnant, it's a medical term, she might call um, in her sometimes slightly mean way, null. And um, somebody writes in signing off as, it's the chromosomes, huh? And she writes back, dear itch. So you'll see a few of those. I'm going to just read some selections from this. And Wendy's going to come up and, and, um, and do the part of the, the letter writers. Dear poetess, what do you think was the greatest poetess of the 20th century? Sarah Teasdale or Adelaide Crapsey? Wondering. Dear Wondering, a usage note at dictionary.com states, many critics have argued that there are sexist connotations in the use of the suffix ess to indicate a female in words like sculptress, waitress, stewardess, and actress. The heart of the problem lies in the non-parallel use of terms to designate men and women. The poetess has long felt that women's equality should be founded in the notion that a woman is no worse than a man. The poetess applies the term poetess to men and women, good poetesses, and bad. It's true that few poems surpass Ms. Adelaide Crapsey's subtly apostrophed lines from her cinquain November night, like steps of passing ghosts, the leaves frost crisped break from the trees and fall. Or Ms. Sarah Teasdale's A November Night. Think that every path we ever took has marked our footprints in mysterious fire, delicate gold that only fairies see. What is a poetess without ghosts, fairies, mysteries, and other consolations? So, Mr. Charles Bukowski. I was always a natural slob. I liked to lay upon the bed in undershirt, st stained of course, and with cigarette holes, shoes off, beer bottle in hand. From the great slob. He is our greatest poetess. Love the poetess. Dear poetess, but seriously, What's the difference between a male poetess and a female poetess? Signed, it's the chromosomes, huh? Dear Itch. OK, there is one difference. A male poetess can say, getting soft, dude, getting soft, while delivering a punch to another male poetess's expanding gut. A female poetess can never, ever, ever say this to her sisters in poetry, with punching or without. Love the poetess. <clears throat> Dear poetess, my poetry teacher keeps saying things like, poetry is what you get when your language aspires to be more than utilitarian. Install power words to produce jolts of feeling. Recently, I noticed he does this with his eyes closed. Who should I report this to? Signed, 21st Century Poet. Dear 21st Century Poet, is your teacher an adjunct with a double full-time teaching load at 2,500 a class without health insurance, job security, or other benefits? Overworked teachers generally have a talent for teaching while sleeping. I'm surprised you noticed. In my day, students universally practice their own version, listening while sleeping. Love the poetess. And for the final letters, um, Wendy is going to read letters from three people in a row. And then the poetess will answer them all. <clears throat> Dear poetess, now that I'm pregnant with my first child, friends and strangers put their hands on my belly and say things like, you're a poet, don't worry. Having a baby is like writing a book. Is this even true? Signed, Poet Mom-to-be. Dear poetess, I love being a mom, but my husband, we met when, when we were both creative writing MFA students, complains I'm shortchanging myself and my talents because my attachment parenting techniques, holding the children 24-7, co-sleeping, breastfeeding still going strong with a waist and seven, 
Mina Loy, four, and the twins, Walt and Emily, two, have made some of our favorite adult activities impossible. He says you never want to, mm, anymore. He doesn't use the word right, but I'm pretty sure that's what he means. Signed, mother addicted re relentlessly to young rascals. And dear poetess, why do mothers think they're so special? Anybody can pop a child out. Writing a book of poems is much harder. Nulipara. Dear Pomo, Martyr, and Null, treat the poem as the child and the child as the poem. Failed babies should not be thrown away. Instead, tuck them in a drawer or save them on a memory stick. Who knows when you'll want to dig them out, pull them apart, and work them up again. Finished babies should be given classic or clever names, stamped diagnostically approved by the Pediatric Industrial Complex Committee on Random Developmental Milestones, and multiply submitted to kindergartens for publication. Meanwhile, poems should be burped, diapered, and placed on their backs to sleep, however much they may scream and try to turn over. Corporal punishment is not recommended, but if you must spank the poem, never do so in anger. The community remains divided on whether or not a daily vitamin is useful, but those baby Tennyson teach your poem to rhyme before it can scan, and baby Avant teach your poem to experiment before it has even skimmed Patterson DVDs, have been thoroughly discredited and may be returned for store credit. And remember, you can't finish a child or book without making lots of mistakes. Confidential to Mr. Martyr, nagging will get you nowhere, in bed or out. Try champagne, oysters, and mopping the damn floor for a change. Love the poetess. Thank you. So he asked me how much of what I read was based on real life experiences. Um, well, um, when, when I teach creative writing workshops, the, I have a sort of discussion protocol and the last about you know, how we run discussion and things that are good to say and things that you shouldn't say. And one of the things I always say is um, all, everything brought to this class is treated as fiction. Um, don't ask, did this really happen? But that's OK, because we're not in class. <laughs> um, so um, um, I, I, um, I write poems from my experience. And I write poems that, in what I would say, is, is the persona of myself. Um, but um, a lot of it is fictionalized, and a lot of it is, um, I would say I'm, I'm looking for a sort of the emotional truth more than the factual truth. I'm not, I'm not using stories to try to tell what happened to me. If I did that, I would write nonfiction essays and tell what happened to me, and you'd be bored. Because um, I'm boring, basically. But, um, but I am, um, um, I'm, I think I'm, I use story as a way to get at some kind of imbalance. And as a way to, I mean, there's a lot of ways that poets, I think a lot of poets are trying to do that, get, get at some kind of balanced imbalance or, or compositional feeling of, you know. But, but I think there are a lot of ways to get there. I use story as a way to get there. And um, I have certain things that I, I am, you know, I'm, I'm interested in politics and I'm interested in literature and I am a mother and I am, a, I am an adjunct creative writing teacher. Um, and, but I've never taught at Princeton. So, um, so I make a lot of stuff up and I use a lot of stuff. Um, when I read that poem about the dinky and like I have students in the audience, I'm a, I'm a little worried that they think I'm sitting in class writing down everything they say in order to make fun of them. But I really think, I actually think I'm very affectionate towards them in the poem. I actually do like my students, even though I say that I struggle with it. So uh, to answer your question, none of it is true. It's just a bunch of words on a page. But some of it may have come from experience. I use it, yeah. 